Greetings, this is Lori Stropowski, and I'm going to be bringing you the next episode in our challenging measurement series, the cervix in pregnancy. So why is the gravid cervix important to measure? Well, that's because preterm birth is a very big problem, both globally in the U.S., and the shortened cervix early in pregnancy is a good predictor, as well as the fact that today we had several management options that exist. Why is it so hard to measure? Well, there's controversy regarding the numbers, what and how to measure, some inherent technical issues, and a lot of pitfalls, which will be the focus of my lecture today. So the normal cervical length is 28 to 50 millimeters transvaginally. Uh, the physiologic changes that occur do so from the inside out, and where ultrasound has great advantage. So important numbers between 16 and under 24 weeks, 25 millimeters is a cutoff that most people use. Uh, going up to 30 if the patient has a history of a prior preterm birth or there's any evidence of funneling. Now between 24 and 34 weeks, the role of cervical length is less clear unless the patient is having contractions at which point we will take 15 millimeters or 30 millimeters with funneling. And then over 34 weeks, it just doesn't matter. So funneling, a little bit of controversy about whether or not this is an independent predictor of preterm birth, but it is an important observation that we want to mention. So trust your vaginal ultrasound, having to do with the configuration of the lower uterine segment relative to that endocervical canal. In particular, you don't want to miss the U-shaped cervix. I call this the uh-oh, because this is a sign of impending labor particularly if you see debris within the cavity, which might be a sign of infection. Now, what to measure? If you look in the literature, all of these measurements have been described. You can go ahead and add the funnel angle and the funnel finger thing to that, because as far as I'm concerned, that is all fake news. All that is really important that they want to know is the residual closed cervix, point A to point B, and that is it. So what about the curved cervix? One set of calipers may foreshorten, that is as the crow flies. However, if it is long enough, we are good. If it is short, you might wanna use two sets of calipers or more, but avoid that trace function because that is too variable and may over measure. Good news is that the pathologically shortened cervix will typically have a straight cervical canal, so it's a moot point. Thumbs up if it's curved, then everything is cool. So sonographic approach, the ACR appropriateness criteria addresses these different four variants uh, with these techniques. Uh, while transvaginal is considered the gold standard, it doesn't always have to be the initial imaging. So transabdominal, we put the probe on the urinary bladder. This is what we see. We've got a little bit of air in the vagina. We've got our contours of the cervix, the hypoechoic submucous glands, the echogenic cervical plug looking like this. Even without fluid in the bladder, we can often see these structures quite well, which was why this was given a nine for uh, the initial imaging for in low risk and first pregnancies or the first variant. Now, knowing that the urinary bladder, if it's distended, can falsely elongate the cervix, they suggested we might go up to 36 as the cutoff to equate with the 25 transvaginally. And this is initial imaging because if we're not seeing it well or it's short, we need to do something more. Limitations have to do with shadowing, inadequate bladder distension, uh, as well as there are numerous pitfalls. So inadequate visualization. If you don't have fluid in the bladder, you'll have a poor acoustic window. It can be really challenging to see. We know the cervix is in this region. Is this where we put the calipers? We go to transvaginal and oh my goodness, there are bulging membranes, our hourglass configuration, created by the cervix right here. When we look in retrospect, we can appreciate that, but that was pretty darn hard to see. So got to see it well. If any uncertainty, go to something else. In terms of bulging membranes, while this is a very alarming picture and you want to put the caliper someplace, note that there's nothing to measure here. We just want to report it. When you have a very long cervix, there's no reason why a cervix should be seven centimeters. It may be due to an over distended bladder. We see here that when we follow the contour, that first turn of the bladder takes us to the inner cervix. Everything above that is not cervix. We have our empty and now we can get an accurate measurement of the cervix. When you have kissing contractions of the lower uterine segment, it creates a very similar picture. Cervix too long, you look at the first turn, these are contractions and these are shoulders. So shoulders equals contract 
contractions. Uh, we wait for that to go away, and then we can accurately measure the cervix. Easy to tell when the cervix is too long, when it's measuring shorter than that, though we have to still look for those shoulders. We want to go to endovaginal in these scenarios. This was a much shortened cervix, so look for those shoulders. Contractions can also simulate funneling, so we can wait and those should go away. Uh, funneling can also be simulated by abundant mucus, so if you're questioning it, you just go to endovaginal, you look at the inner cervix for those intact membranes. This is not funneling, this is abundant mucus and where we should place the calipers. Now, transperineal, you can use a sector or a curvilinear probe, you apply a dressing, place that on the perineum, and this is what we are seeing. This is air within the vagina, so these are your vaginal walls, our anatomical structures of the cervix seen very nicely. We've got air going all the way and outlining the cervical lips, it's even prettier. So this is considered appropriate for initial imaging in our fourth variant prior to induction of active labor because there's very good correlation with the digital exam if it's necessary. It may also be appropriate when transabdominal is inadequate or for the patient declines transvaginal or premature rupture of the membranes. Limitations are in the way of shadowing from the pubis or the rectum. We know that transperineal can undermeasure the cervix, particularly early in pregnancy. Probably the biggest limitation is that this technique requires experience from both the sonographer and the interpreter. So here you're seeing a difference of 1.5 centimeters in the measurement between transperineal and transabdominal because we've got this shadowing uh, from rectal gas. Here's another scenario, a very short cervix at 1.4 Lots of shadowing here on endovaginal, it is fine. So any question we need to go to transvaginal. Good news is that the inner cervix, those important changes are not gonna be obscured by any gas. Uh, just make sure you don't confuse again that for the abundant mucus. Any question, you go to transvaginal. So transvaginal is our gold standard because we are right up on the cervix. We get these beautiful images, see all of our anatomical structures, make sure you appreciate the vagina so you don't include those in your calipers. Make sure that the anterior and posterior widths of the cervix are the same so that you know you're not applying too much pressure. This is considered appropriate as initial imaging with a history of prior preterm birth or suspected preterm labor because the consequences of missing a short cervix are just too high and carries both very high positive and negative predictive values for preterm birth. So limitations, pitfalls have to do in the way of dynamic changes and probe pressure, though our nemesis, the kissing contractions still apply. Neck of the bladder takes us to the inner cervix. Those are contractions, you wait, they go away. Dynamic cervix, can we can see these changes very quickly. Some suggest that in a high risk uh, patient uh, that you might wanna wait up to five minutes to look for these. Uh, if you don't put the probe in all the way, the vagina can simulate the cervix here. The cervix was looking a little patchless. We, I asked the technologist uh, to put the probe in a little further and all of a sudden we can see those contours. So make sure you are far in enough. On the other hand, we don't wanna to apply too much pressure or we can close an open cervix as demonstrated here. So we need to keep a light hand. Now, I've heard this tip before, watch real time as you enter to avoid slipping in. I really didn't know what that meant to this recent case where they said that she was clinically one to two centimeters dilated. We were getting good measurements. I asked my sonographer to perform transvaginal and sure enough, just slipped right in there up to two millimeters away. I'm like, whoa, back up here. And that's because this is a very ripe, perhaps overripe service, very soft. So yes, watch as you enter to avoid slipping in. This patient was offered a cerclage, she declined, which brings me to my last point, which is uh, the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine does not recommend cervical length screening with cerclages, basically because there's nothing else they can offer the patient, but we may be asked to look to confirm appropriate placement. Uh, what you wanna measure, again, is that residual closed cervix. And you might wanna add another measurement of how much closed cervix is above uh, the cerclage wires or if you're not seeing any cervix above those wires. So that's all I've got. I am at your cervix and thank you for your attention.